unfortunately it's happening now in instances where guys are even less less uh, 25 and, and up but at your at, at 30 you should take ownership of your health and this is discussed heavily in the book and, and dissected in the book but what I mean by that is you can't rely on your doctor right even if you have a good family physician because they're not trained necessarily to really evaluate your blood testosterone levels and your blood testosterone levels is really the key and, and the differentiator of you being like you know a man who has masculinity right um, because what's happening today with the environment being as bad as it is, and I know you want to talk about this in a second, but we're kind of under war. Uh, we're at war. Our endocrine systems are at war with the environment. So men today at an earlier age have less sperm, uh, less modal sperm, and then also lower testosterone, natural testosterone output, which is uh, you know, creating this situation where men really need to understand whether or not they need to replace their testosterone through uh, you know, viable uh, script prescription with a doctor and working with a progressive doctor going forward with that. And so, so why is it now that it's hard to find the truth behind the testosterone? Is it just because it's not, you know, no one really talks about it or it's just kind of frowned upon to be talking about? No, it's a great question. Um, and then this is heavily addressed in the first two chapters of the book, but um, the easiest way to explain it is that 50 years ago, this wasn't a subject because men 50 years ago and even earlier than that weren't dealing with the hormonal phytoestrogens and all the other stuff that's in the air from quote unquote modern day societal living that's suppressing our natural testosterone production. The stigma or the demonization that you're kind of referring to really comes from the stuff that went on in the 70s and 80s and even into the 90s with baseball and the Balco, Balco steroid scandal where they made the usage of performance enhancing drugs um, assimilated or correlated with testosterone replacement therapy. And as we all know, it's completely separate right. topic, right? Performance enhancement, using anabolic steroids, blah, 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 for sports and all that stuff is a completely separate animal and different channel than what I'm talking about in this book. You know, this book is not a steroid Bible. It's not a, a performance enhancement book. It's literally how does a man, you know, deal with this horrible environmental situation of lessening testosterone, lessening sperm count to use testosterone to replace. For those baseball players or athletes that were on some form of steroids, you know, they're getting up in age and they were, you know, they're talking about how you can't perform that good at 35 right. as you did when you were 20. But, if, right. you know, but if, they, if that's all they were doing was replacing the testosterone that they were lacking, is there anything really wrong with that aspect as you get older? Absolutely not. I mean, you know, obviously there's an ethical question in that question itself, but, and that's also tackled in the book heavily. Um, I don't believe there is. Um, I, I think you can correlate it to having Lasix done on your eyes to improve your vision, right? Um, a woman wants to get implants, a woman wants to have facial surgery to, re, you know, reconstruction or, you know, surgery down here after having childbirth. It's all the same thing. It's, you know, there's an aesthetic component because using testosterone, if you also dial everything else in, which obviously, again, is discussed in the book, which is your diet, your nutrition, your mindset, um, will improve your aesthetic look if you do all those other things. It's not a panacea. It's not going to be I take testosterone and I all of a sudden have fat loss and I have big muscles. That doesn't come with it. But th the answer to your question is yes. I mean, there shouldn't be a stigma attached to it. But again, because of the past... Um, because of the you know media demonization of it, um, it, there's still the connotation, unfortunately, or correlation that you know, oh, it's performance enhancement, oh, it's cheating. But it's, how, do, how do we get not. how do we get away from that then? Because well, I, I, I know right now, like if I went home and told my wife, hey, like I need to go get checked because I might need this or whatever, she'd look at me funny, like I'm trying to take steroids, right? And that's right. just you know the initial reaction. No, no, absolutely, it's a great question, a great point, and how I counter that is, it's slowly but surely going away. As more and more people get educated to this crisis, as more and more people start realizing that testosterone replacement therapy is really just a form of progressive medicine, um, that stigmata or that demonization will, will lessen. It's still important, though, for you to have a conversation. Again, this is discussed in the book with your wife or your spouse or your significant other, um, you know, that this is not cheating. I'm not breaking the law. I'm not doing anything illegal. This is all done, you know, through legal channels and pathways. And I'm doing this to improve my life. And I think that's the number one thing is if you're 35 or 40 and you guys already know this, but maybe for you guys that don't, um, if you're suffering from low testosterone, you literally have one of the worst feelings in your, in your life. I mean, you're, you have low energy, you're depressed. I mean, a lot of guys are contemplating suicide at 40, 45 who have 250 levels of testosterone. That's crazy. Now, let's just say I'm that guy that's that's suffering from low testosterone. It's a difficult conversation to have with your spouse. What's the steps do I need to do? do am I listening to some of these infomercials that you're starting to see or commercials that are out there? 
Uh, do I need to consult first with a doctor? What What's recommended? Great, what's that first great, step? Great question. That literally is li- literally, I think, the thesis of the book. The entire book is wrapped around like, what does a guy do? How right. do I go to this? And so my answer to that is, the first thing that you can do, because we don't have the best medical care, let's say, as we get closer to the middle part of the country versus the coast where we have more progressive physicians, is you take ownership of your health by getting your blood tested on your own, right? You go to a private lab collection company like Private MD Labs, discountedlabs.com. There's a number of them, okay? And you order a pre hormone or a male wellness panel, depending on your age, and you get that back. And then you have two options. You can take it to your doctor if you have a family doctor and you can, you know, educate yourself. First off, you can buy the book, okay, because the book tells you how to educate yourself yeah, on the start there. <laughs> well, okay, I mean, But I mean, honestly, can... this is this is the stepping stone for every man. Yeah. And there's other books too, but nothing in my opinion has been written this lay for the average person to read, especially men. And women can read this book too, as Monica can tell you, um, and, and, and give it to their husbands. But this book was written so that you could take it to your doctor That's and okay. say, yeah. Doc, hey. You know, you need to measure my blood testosterone. And if he, and this is what normally happens. They, they push back depending on your age because, you know, again, nothing against doctors, but doctors have a standard patient care model that they normally follow, right? And so if you're at a certain age, you know, under 40 normally, even under 45 with most docs, they don't even consider you as having low blood testosterone. So they just push you away. And what they do is, and this is horrible, and this is, there's millions of men in North America dealing with this. They script you an SSRI inhibitor, which is like a mood altering medication, like Paxil or Wellbutrin or whatever, and erectile dysfunction drugs, Mm. Cialis or Viagra. So you never source the actual root cause of the issue, which is low testosterone. And what you do is, and I've had literally hundreds if not thousands of guys that I've consulted with who have told me this, it screws up their brain chemistry worse, right? Because those drugs are doing things to your brain chemistry over time. So the solution ultimately really is, and I know it sounds like a panacea because obviously I wrote the book on it, but having your blood testosterone levels to find out where you're at and then hopefully using a progressive physician who knows what they're doing to dial you in will solve all your problems. Now, is this like heart medicine? They say that with heart medicine, once you start taking, you're taking for the rest of your life. Is this something that if my testosterone levels are low and I start doing testosterone therapy, am, am I on this for a few months? Am I on this for the rest of my life? I'm 40 now. Right. So, I mean, is this something that I need to prepare to do? So, it's a great question. If you take testosterone replacement products like mm-hmm. injections, mm-hmm. cream, um, other transdermals, there's there's actually 10 different delivery systems and they're all discussed in the book. But um, yes, the answer is you will need to take that for the rest of your life. However, there are medications that can increase your natural production of testosterone that won't allow you to do that. Now, here's the, here's the, so, so the, it's a great question. It leads into the next point. Most guys freak out because they're like, oh, I don't want to disturb my natural production right. by taking this the rest of my life. Mm-hmm. But right. the truth is you don't have any by 45. So the, the, this thought pattern of, oh my God, I don't want to have to use that and replace my natural testosterone production. Well, you're not going to have any. So do you want to be that 45 or 50 year old guy who suffers and just like puts his, you know, buries his head in the sand and says, I'm not going to use testosterone because I don't need it, you know? And here's the other thing too, and we don't, we're, I don't want to go down, a, this is an esoteric discussion, but I don't want to go down a path. Like a lot of doctors mess this up because they look at a guy who's like at a 320 range or a 360 range. And that's like borderline. There's different range panels, but 300 to 1100 is normal testosterone range. So when they're suboptimal, but they're not off the radar, meaning below 300, they just say, oh, they're okay. But what happens is, is a lot of guys, especially athletic guys who are, you know, previous or, or former athletes, they were functioning in their 20s with eight or 900, right? So now they're at 300 or 330 or whatever they're at. So they're literally at one, or excuse me, um, 200% less than where they were when they were normal. But the docs kind of keep them still saying because they're in the range. And again, this is heavily discussed in the book. So you can't look at your actual blood levels, meaning the measurement on a piece of paper, you have to uh, treat by symptoms. So it's a clinical diagnosis versus actual blood range values. So when you're going with your blood paperwork to the yes. doctor, what, what are they looking for? So, so the number one symptom of low testosterone is brain fog. Okay. The average 40 year old guy who has low testosterone literally by two o'clock in the afternoon is about to fall over and die. Hmm. Like literally they're like, Oh my God, I can't get through the day. So what do these guys do? They pound <laughs> coffee. Hold on, hold on. But literally they pound coffee. 
yeah. or they take a stimulant, Adderall, whatever it is that gets them through the day. Guys are taking fat burners, you know, thermogenics, whatever. But they're stimulant junkies because they can't yeah. make it through. When the truth is, is once you're optimized and your testosterone is balanced, and, and, and the number one goal, and again, written out in the book, number one goal of testosterone therapy is lifelong happiness. I'm not kidding you. It's, it's a balance between your testosterone and estrogen. Right. And that produces that optimal feeling, that high energy, the super passion, you're exuberant. You know, you, you, you just have energy. It's boundless energy you go through your day. So, Jay, let me ask you this. Am, am, I, am I helping one thing with testosterone therapy and, and affecting me with something else? Again, I look back at the commercials, right? They say, I, they've, they've got a pill for this and therapy for that. But the symptoms are, you know, right. you're gonna, all these bad things are going to happen to you. No, so, so it's a great question. And all of that, I have an entire, it's really two chapters, but one chapter is chapter 10 in the book. There's 14 chapters in the book. It's almost 200 pages. There's 230 medical citations. It's heavily researched. There's nothing, there's no, um, everything is completely um, objective. There's no subjectivity in the book. But all of the hyperbolized and, you know, uh, demonized side effects of testosterone, like prostate, um, heart disease, right. These are really what's happened is, is the media has allowed opportunistic attorneys. You guys have all heard the, you know, the commercials, yep. especially here in San Diego yep. for all the heart things. Now, this is all heavily, again, discussed in the book. And I and we actually, with some other doctors who helped me with the research, we attack some of these studies that the attorneys are using to say that, you know, testosterone use, the use of testosterone can cause heart or vascular issues or what any of that stuff. And the truth is... The study that that was all based on, and this is literally the last five years of all this stuff that's come out with attorneys, was based on a, it's called the Tom trial. And it was 65 year old men and up who had already heart morbid, uh, morbidities. So these are guys that were already sick and not like, you know, optimal. And then, and, and like, I think it was 56% in the mean. So like 6% over the actual, like, it doesn't even matter in, in the study had a heart issue. So these guys, it, it doesn't apply when you apply it to like the average population base with normal guys, aging guys, it doesn't even apply. So it's bogus, bad data that they're basing their studies on. But again, but why though? Attor because attorneys are opportunistic. Gotcha. And attorneys are going to attack, and, and they could. And it's another situation, too, where they knew that there's no standard patient. Remember, we're going back to the whole doctor standard patient of care. There is no standard patient of care for hormone therapy, right? To hormone therapy, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, TRT, testosterone replacement therapy, has been going on for 25 years. But 25 years ago, the only guys that were taking it were wealthy, very, very affluent, working with exotic clinics like Metagenics, Senogenics, Dr. Life, all those guys. And even though those guys did a decent job, today the science has advanced so much that if you work with a great, uh, a great doctor, and obviously I work with a number of them and I, 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 I recommend a number of them very highly, you have no issues. I mean, you, it, this, is, like, I, th this is the average guy who goes on testosterone at 35 or 40 and up the rest of their life, they remember their life as like pre-TRT, post-TRT. That's how good it is. Now again, it's true. Thank you.